hear me? So it's time for the writing in talk session. Yay! <laughs> okay, so, yes, yeah, so I brought this from Japan. So anyway, so there are 15 talks are scheduled in 60 minutes and four optional talks are scheduled. So there is no guarantee we can schedule the four optional talks, but let's schedule as many talks as possible. So the hard limit is three minutes. So here is Kei san uh, who is time keeping. So please keep the three minute limit. Okay, so let's start. So the first one is Hanukkah. <laughs> yes, sorry, so I'll start this. So, so what's next in oil pump? So after shipping. So oil pump is now in the launching zone, so yay. Hmm. So what's next after shipping? So of course, the first priority is to fix all crash reports and stabilize. So we are going to ship oil pump for a limited number of users on Canary Bills only on Wednesday. So we are going to collect crash reports and fix them and stabilize. And after that, we want to clean up the code base and remove all will be types, finally. And the second priority is path thread heaps and use after free detection with oil pump pointers. So I'd like to explain what the path thread heaps is. So this is the current heap design. So the v heap is completely isolated path thread. However, oil pump heap is shared among threads. So this is a misdesign in many senses. So the first problem is performance is not isolated per thread. So all worker threads need to stop and join a garbage collection because of objects allocated by the main thread. So this is a critical issue for a compositor worker, for example. And the second problem is the overhead to stop all threads can be unacceptable. So when the main thread starts a garbage collection, it needs to wait for all other threads to enter a safe point. So we added safe points to a bunch of places, for example, at the end of event loops before acquiring a mutex or V8 interrupters, but it's not enough. So what we are currently doing is the main thread just gives up the garbage collection if it fails at stopping all the threads in 100 milliseconds, but 100 millisecond pause is scary. And also, thread programming with oil pan is super hard. So there are a lot of complicated restrictions about closed thread pointers, uh, which is too complicated to explain here. So here is a solution. So we want to split heaps. So like V8 heaps, uh, we split oil pump heap, and each heap is path thread. So by doing that, we can solve this problem. So that's it. Thank you. So if you are the next player, uh, speaker, please stand in line. Hi, um, my name is Jun. I work at Intel Open Source Technology Center. Um, I'm going to talk about the CS LAN display specification and its implementation status. Uh, you know, so we have used rectangular device for a long time since TV was invented. But you know, so there are many uh, Android watches which has a round display like this. Uh, even there are shape-free form display on market. So. So that's why uh, LG and Intel are working together for the CS round display. The, the specification is actively under discussion at W3C. We have been work implementing some features on in the crosswalk, which is a random time engine based on Brink. So CSS round display defines several new properties and new value. So I can explain one by one. Here's a device video. Device radius new media query new video query, which allows uh, apply a set a different set of style sheet, CSS style sheet for the round display. Uh, as you can see, the, there are two web applications, but these are one single application. So they are used. Uh, they have two different UI. The UI is specifying the the different the CSS file. The CSS file the CSS files can be chosen. At um, when the web page loading, so by using the device uh, device radius value. So the problem is the the current Android Wear returns only the whether the information 
whether uh, the display is round or not. So we need more information on the uh, display shape. For example, so if the display is a elliptical display, we cannot uh, get those information. So we already got uh, looks good to me for the device radius media query. So we are planning to submit the patches soon. And uh, here is a polar coordinate. This is a new way to position element uh, inside the round display. The, the polar UI defined the four different uh, new properties, polar angle, polar distance, polar anchors, polar origin. So, and uh, here's a demo. This is a web application, so which shows a round display using the polar UI on the Android Wear. So, here is a boundary display new properties. As you know, so the CSS box model, the, uh, on, so in this case, the, the four corners can be hidden in the round display. So if you use the border boundary properties, you can draw the borders around the display border. Okay, here is uh, the last, last one. Is, uh, we defined a new value for the shape inside, so which allows to align the text fully uh, in the round display. Okay, this is very useful for the round display. Okay, uh, that's all I have today. So if you want to see demos, I have uh, some the demo running on my watches. So please come to me, I can show the demo. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my name is Roberto Prodigi. I'm an outsider here. I'm an academic, uh, sorry. And uh, uh, so, but the thing is that why I'm here is we have, my students and I have um, uh, this project called Web Capsule uh, that essentially uh, has an ambition, uh, ambitious goal, uh, which is to build a record replay engine for, uh, for Blink. And essentially the, uh, what we really want to do is uh, record all the non-determinism uh, that uh, happens in, in inside the browser, well, especially in terms of user inputs and uh, web traffic and uh, platform API calls and so on. We want to store that uh, basically uh, as the user browse, br uh, browses the internet and uh, eventually we want to be able to replay all of that in a completely isolated environment with no new user input, no new uh, network traffic and so on. At the same time, we want to be lightweight, transparent, but for agnostic and always on. The reason why we want to be always on is because we are doing this to, uh, for example, record and then eventually replay, say, security incidents, which are, of, of course, unexpected or uh, bugs and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so here's a very high level overview of what uh, we do and how we do it. So we put instrumentation shims around Blink and V8 uh, at the web API and platform uh, API levels. Uh, and essentially, uh, we for the uh, web API uh, shims, we build our own uh, DevTools agent uh, that uh, records all the uh, input events. Uh, and for the uh, platform API, essentially what we do is we uh, wrap it so that we can uh, record the return value of things such as current time and, and more interesting things such as uh, being able to record and replay asynchronous uh, requests and responses. And uh, we, we also wrap things in uh, JavaScript to record non-determinism. This is an example of how we wrap uh, math.random and uh, are able to record and replay uh, random values. Of course, we do a lot more in terms of wrapping uh, uh, the JavaScript uh, uh, V8 API, uh, platform API. And here's how we do replay. Uh, and essentially, the way we do replay now is we just uh, uh, given the web API events, we just re-inject them in the we uh, web API. We just call back uh, the web API methods, so say handle input event and so on. We let Blink uh, process those events and as uh, Blink makes the, say, network requests that are uh, uh, related to processing those events, we just return back the values that we had uh, previously recorded. And we have already obtained some uh, actually good success with this, although this is a very ambitious goal, as, uh, goal 
uh, that we have, as I said. So uh, the reason why I'm here is really to share ideas with you guys uh, and uh, and get fe feedback. Hopefully, I mean that's that's really uh, my main goal. And uh, we have a uh, the source code is up on webcapsule.org. We have demos uh, of how a web capsule works, an academic paper. And uh, if you are interested, please uh, talk to me. I would be very happy to share ideas. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Nico. I want to talk very briefly about uh, Clang for Windows. So if you don't know, Clang is a friendly C++ compiler. So let's say you've been writing Java for a while, and then you write uh, character array foo equals ASDF. Uh, then some compilers will expect you to know what an unqualified ID is. Uh, well, Clang tells you, well, you probably want to put your brackets over there. <laughs> um, and Clang is also the default compiler we use uh, for Chrome to build Chrome production builds on uh, Mac and Linux. And we also um, basically update Clang in Chromium every few weeks, so it's kind of an evergreen C++ compiler. And the C++ compiler is kind of to y'all like uh, Blink is to web developers, so you should understand that this is uh, pretty nice. Uh, but it wasn't uh, available on Windows, uh, so we are changing that, so we're working on that. Um. <laughs> Um, so if you do hack on Blink on Windows, uh, you should give it a try, I feel. Um, it's very easy to use. You have to run this very long thing once, uh, which will download the compiler. After that, it will stay automatically updated. And then you need to either say clang equals one in your drip defines, or if you use gn, uh, you have to say is clang equals true. Uh, then you run jip or gn again. Um, and if you do this in ncon, which is like a NC escape code terminal emulator on Windows, then you even get uh, color diagnostics, and you just build, and uh, you'll use Clang, and it'll be grand. Uh, and if you think it's not grand, then you just undo step two and re again, and then you're back on the old stuff. Um, so one thing that's cool is that um, Clang has this uh, Blink-specific oil pan plugin, um, which tells you if you get, um, if you define a new class, you need to ma sometimes add a few trace mac macros. Uh, and if you get this wrong, then the tribots will tell you this on um, Linux and Mac, but now you will also see this locally on Windows. Um, this is actually like being used. Like we already shipped a canary that's completely built with Clang and nothing blew up. Um, one thing that might be surprising to people is that uh, compiler MSVS and Blink is true with Clang on Windows, just like compiler GCC is true with Clang on uh, Mac and Linux because GCC tries to emulate uh, the Visual Studio compiler on Windows just like it tries to emulate GCC um, on non-Windows. Uh, and finally, there isn't any debug info yet. So if you ever write bugs and you use debuggers, then uh, maybe this isn't for you yet. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I, I personally never write any bugs, or if I do, I use printf. So for me, that's not a problem. Uh, so in closing, that makes development uh, on Windows 78% funner, uh, measured scientifically. Thank you. Hey, so I get asked all the time, what's up with file system APIs, Josh? So I thought I'd share that with everybody here. Uh, well, what are we talking about? The web platform has this file API concept, the notion of blobs and files and HTML bindings for those that mostly works, lets you get files in and out of web pages and into scripts, modify them. Um, directories, being able to drag an entire directory, say of music files into your uh, music player site or files to upload to Drive or Dropbox, not so much. Chrome has a solution there, but it's not standardized across browsers. When you want to do full-on file system, like access to the native file system through some permissions, or even a sandbox file system, again, not standardized across browsers. Uh, why would you want a file system API? Mostly get out of the developer's way. Uh, databases and caches have their uses, but sometimes you just need low-level primitives, like fopen, fread, fwrite. Um, or maybe you're building an application like a photo editor or photo gallery, and again, via permissions, you'd like access to the user's local files. Well, in 2009, we actually uh, implemented and spec'd a file system API in Chrome with most of these bells and whistles. Um, and uh, we shipped it. It's there in Chrome today with a prefix, because that's how we did things back then. And waited for other browser vendors to adopt it, because it was awesome. 
and not so much. Uh, some of them thought, well, why can you not just build this on top of a uh, database API? Uh, others objected to the specifics around the design of the API. It was a bit clunky. It uses callbacks instead of promises because those weren't around back then. Um, and others just were playing catch up on their browsers and they weren't ready to start implementing uh, a new spec yet. So what's the current status? Well, it's still pretty grim. Um, Mozilla has a file an alternate file system API proposal. It's much cleaner than what was in Chrome. It's more modern. Um, but there are no implementations of it yet. Uh, it does support sandboxed uh, file systems, but it's missing things like uh, integration with streaming. Um, one of the most pr higher priority use cases is that directory upload case. So Mozilla and Microsoft carved off part of the spec uh, as a directory upload standard. Mozilla started implementing it. Microsoft uh, was so, um, it interop was so important for them that they actually went ahead and implemented the WebKit prefixed version that's in Chrome today, even though they weren't so happy with it. Um, we've also started carving off portions of what was built into file system, like temporary and persistent storage, as part of a separate standard so that it can underlie all storage APIs. Um, you can actually build a file editor today using the file APIs, um, but it's pretty grim. You don't get uh, the ability to associate with a file type, such as images or text. Uh, you don't have streaming APIs, and you can't even just resave the same file you open. You end up downloading it again. The storage team is working on fundamentals, uh, like improving blob transport quota system, durable permission. So they're not actively working on file system API work here. Um, but if this is something of interest to you, it'd be great to get your feedback on the proposals. And if you're interested in helping out with implementation, we'd like that too. Thanks. All right, so I want to talk about a feature I worked on uh, called V8 Extras. Uh, so what are V8 Extras? So from your perspective at BlinkOn, they're a new way of writing Blink features in, in JavaScript. Uh, it's very low level. We compile it directly into the V8 snapshot. So there's no startup time cost like there is with V8 extensions uh, or other things like that. Um, there's no indirection through the bindings uh, or integration with WebIDL. So this is a, a plus and a minus. So it's, it's very low overhead. It's just like the built-ins, you know, object array, promise, map, set in V8, um, but also you don't get any of the protections that a WebIDL binding layer gives you. Um, and, and so mainly uh, because of these features, it's useful for self-contained things uh, like streams, which is the other feature I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on, or for layered platform work where it can just sit on top of the APIs we already have, but doesn't need to integrate directly with like the node hierarchy or things like that. Um, so it is in use today. Uh, it's, it's in master. It's been in V8 for a while, but we actually have uh, behind Experimental Web Platform features, a small part of the stream spec, uh, this byte length queuing strategy class, is implemented with the V8 extras. So you can flip on Experimental Web Platform features, and it's there. Um, I'm finishing up a large CL uh, with the rest of streams, uh, readable streams, implemented in V8 extras, um, and that's, that's pretty exciting. And there's also a, another experimental CL out there showing how it could be used for uh, scroll customization, so the Snap Manager class. Um, so so it's, all, it's all going pretty well from my perspective. Um, all right, so, so just an example of how this works. Uh, the, so first you add it to the build file. You say, here's my JavaScript file. Um, and there's all, both normal versions, uh, which get compiled into the snapshot, and the experimental versions, which you can toggle on and off with experimental web platform features, but actually do impose a startup time cost. Um, and you have to do it both in JIP and JIN, of course. Um, so, so here's an example of what a extra file looks like. It's pretty basic JavaScript, but there's a few things to call out here. Um, first is that. We don't get the normal scope resolution, so you have to manually look up everything uh, that's on the global. So that's why we're aliasing object here. Uh, and then to add things to the global, you just define property them like you would uh, in, in normal JavaScript. Um, so that's what we're doing here. The other is this magic bindings object. Now, this is something that is not normal JavaScript. The idea here is that C++ can put things on the bindings object. Here I put compute norm because that's a super complicated mathematical ex uh, operation that you really need C++ for. Uh, and, uh, and I've exported the VEC2 class to C++ so that C++ can create VEC2 instances all at once. Um, and the idea here is like you wouldn't want to create them through the global because author code could mess with the global. This isn't in a separate context. This is every, th everybody is sharing this. Uh, so you need to export something to C++ if you want it to be undisturbed. And the final parameter is, uh, the final extra piece is this V8 object, which has a few extra special APIs that are useful. Uh, for writing this type of code. So, so one thing is it lets you create truly private data, which isn't actually possible in JavaScript, uh, at least not in a performant way. Uh, so, so you create these private symbols, and then you can use them all over the code. Um, and there's a few other APIs on there that are useful for this type of code as well. 
Um, so, so that's basically the, how it works. Um, rough edges, uh, debugging is something I'm currently working on. So, so like, I found this line that you could comment out deep in the uh, V8 uh, code that would let you get errors, but otherwise they just get swallowed. Um, so I need to like add a flag so that during development time at least you could turn that on and get good errors. Um, DevTools added a great feature where you can actually debug into all native code, not just V8 extras or not debug into, you can get profiling information for it. Uh, so you can profile your V8 extras, but you can't debug into them. Um, and I don't know if they work with tracing. I was still, still investigating that. So ideally, I would like to get that all working so that it's all super seamless and you can just use the inspector and all that. So if you work on DevTools, please help me. Um, the other thing that we noticed that was kind of interesting with the Snap Manager is that V8 uh, lazily, just in time compiles, methods that you don't call uh, on, your, on your stuff. So this is a disadvantage versus C++ where it's all pre-compiled ahead of time, of course. So y you know the startup cost is taken care of by snapshotting, but uh, the actual cost of compiling the, the code is still delayed. And, and that kind of sucks because like your first frame for Snap Manager ends up taking a long time. So we're not sure what to do here, if anything. You know, we could try priming the cache, but then the V8 team tells us they'll probably just evict our compiled code anyway. So I don't know. Um, and then the final kind of caveat is that uh, because you're sharing everything, uh, you, you have to be very careful. So, so uh, I could talk about this earlier, but you know, basically I it's, it's low level. Uh, so that's it. Um, yep, that's, that's all I got. Hey, this is cool tips for cleaning up the web platform. Um, it's just uh, to get you excited. Um, <laughs> it's just one tip, and it may not be cool. The SVG Path Seg API, uh, you've probably never heard of this, and after this talk, you probably never will. This was an API added a long time ago to the SVG spec. It's really a, a poorly written API. It's for a different time. Um, it's basically a, a way to take a list and serialize it and keep the serialized version and the list version up to like synced both directions. C just a crazy idea. And because it's so bad, uh, no one really uses it and that's why it's at 0.001% of the web. So it's small on the web, it's big on the code. 10,000 lines of C++, about 3,000 of this was in source. The other six and change was generated code. Basically this thing has a whole bunch of bindings. Um, it's also somewhat large in the APK. 0.1% of our Android APK was this thing. In addition, there's lots of tests. These things we pay the cost of every day. So this is like the clearest cut ever case of something we should probably remove from the platform. And we did, or I should say Frederick removed it. Um, we took it out. Uh, this was basically, it, it took a total of like 10 hours between announcing we're gonna remove it and three LDTMs. Then it took about a week of actual engineering work to remove this thing. And then the users thanked us by complaining a whole lot. Basically, even though we made 99.99% .99 of page views better, uh, some people's pages broke. And that actually hurts the web platform, it hurts our image in terms of like a stable thing that people can develop on. And it hurts our product's image as well because they view this thing in, in one browser, it doesn't work, and it, et cetera. So I did an experiment where I rewrote this thing in JavaScript. Uh, it's an order of magnitude smaller in terms of code and binary, and this is not because I'm a great JavaScript programmer, it's just because this feature is actually easier to write in JavaScript. Um, the cool thing here is I took the test in the patch to remove this feature, and those are my tests for my polyfill. So this is kind of a neat little trick, and it went over really well. Like, the users are happy, and I think this is a technique we should use in the future, in particular, Smile. Um, so it's just one more trick in our uh, toolbox for moving features on the web. Cheers. Hi everyone, 
Uh, I'm Mike, and I'm just going to give you a quick uh, explanation of what the Style Team thinks about our users. Now, when I wrote that slide, uh, I remembered back to what our PR team tells me about using the word users. Uh, there's only two industries that refer to people who use their products as users, software developers and drug dealers. <laughs> but I don't have a better word. So, Anyway, so uh, earlier this year, uh, when trying to figure out what we're going to do, we ask ourselves, like, what is our purpose as a style team? Why do we exist? And so questions we asked ourselves to help with this was, who are our primary users? What do we offer to meet our users' needs? And what promises are we making? So we brainstormed, we whiteboarded it, and I'll transcribe that for you. So our users. Our users are web developers. Our users are framework developers. Our users are end users. Our users are third parties and ad networks. Our users are other Blink developers. That's you guys. We have other, other browser vendors and the W3C. And we are our own users, and so we um, need to take care of ourselves. All right, now, what do they want from us? So for web developers, they want predictability, debuggability, consistency, profilability, grokability, and communications. The framework developers, they want primitives. They want uh, extensibility, and they want interop across browsers. End users, they want interop ac across browsers so the websites work, but they want performance, bandwidth, speed, stability, and they also want to have a good experience. Third parties and ad networks, we need to communicate with them to tell them what we're doing. Other Blink developers, that's you guys. They want communications, they want hackability, they want knowledge about the system, and they also want infrastructure, and by that I mean internal infrastructure in the code like the data structures that we use. Other vendors, other vendors in the W3C, feedback, participation, and direction. And what, what do we want from ourselves? We want sustainable processes and also hackability of the style code itself. So then we went through these and, th and thought, what are we already doing? So for the web developers, the green things are the things we're giving them. Predict this is what, in terms of like the work that we're already doing, this is what we're already giving people. So predictability, consist consistency, and grokability. For framework developers, extensibility and interop. End users, interop. Third parties and ad, net ad networks, nothing yet. Other Blink developers, that's you guys. Hackability, knowledge, and we're working on data structures. Other vendors, uh, feedback, direction, participation in the W3C, that's pretty much Shane right there. The style team, hackability. And so what you're seeing is, um, you can see that there are some holes in what we're doing and we're using this to guide what we're gonna work on in the future. So as we all know, focus on the user and all else will follow. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Orion Hodson, I'm from the Clank performance team in London. And uh, since last quarter we've been working on an interpreter for V8. Um, as you may know, V8 uh, has two compilers and a pretty good um, full code generator, and it's renowned for being fast. And interpreters are famous for being slow. So why are we doing this? Well, memory. Uh, we're interested in Svelte devices with s low memory, um, so we'd like to have a smaller footprint V8. Um, even on desktop, uh, V8 uh, can consume up to 33% of the renderer. And um, if we have an interpreter, we can use uh, the interpreted bytecode and keep that around and potentially discard source files, which will save memory. Uh, we also ha get latency from this, so we can uh, keep the, if we generate the bytecode, we can do that quite quickly, just like uh, full code gen, and we can keep that bytecode around and avoid re-optimizing re the source code. So V8, if it ever goes back and re-optimizes, will re-parse the source code, and we think we can keep the bytecode around and save memory by doing that. So um, this is the piece we've been working on so far. This is the bytecode generator. It basically fits into the V8 framework. Uh, there's great code there for AST parsing, AST generation and uh, we can feed that through to our interpreter. The next phase that we're entering now is to actually feed the compiler so we can actually optimize code from the um, bytecode and pass it down the turbofan pipeline and get optimized code out the other end. And as always, we need to be able to de-optimize the code so that if any optimizations are wrong, we can fall back to the interpreter and then potentially re-optimize in future. 
Uh, very quickly, uh, it's a register machine versus a stack machine if you're into interpreters. We have an accumulator, which is an implicit argument to things, which allows us to um, keep the bytecode small. The bytecode handlers, which are the little functions which execute the each bytecode, are implemented in Turbofan uh, Raw Machine Assembler, which is really cool. We write very little platform-specific code. And for now, we use indirect threaded dispatch. Uh, right now, we can run 90% of ECMAScript 262 tests, which is like 90% is about 28,000 tests, so it's not bad. And we're running five octane benchmarks and the test harness. We're not up to full code gen performance, but that's really what we're aiming for. It needs to be in the same ballpark as full code gen, which is pretty good and pretty mature. Uh, we're doing well on size, so we're operating somewhere between 10% and 20%, maybe sometimes 30% of size uh, across the benchmarks. Which is, our prime, which is our primary goal for the time being. Uh, we are very portable, uh, so this chart quickly shows how much shared code we have per platform. We have 250 lines of platform-specific code versus uh, 3,500 for full code gen, which is the thing that we're kind of competing with. Um, and our shared size will grow, but we're doing pretty well for the time being, being smaller. Uh, takeaways, this is just an investigation for now. It's not, we're not committing to shipping this at the time being. We have an interpreter running. We have uh, the bytecode done. The code is small and portable. We want to be competitive for code gen, and we also want to feed the compiler. That's it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Yuta from the OilPan team. I'm going to talk about the uh, takeaways uh, from the performance measurement. So uh, I measured the performance metrics of uh, uh, various telemetry benchmarks on Android devices for to be able to ship open. But that was hard. Why? So you basically just need to run to the performance benchmark uh, Python script, but uh, there were a lot of uh, the tricky uh, stuff. So I'm going to talk uh, about the three reasons. So first, the tests are slow. Well, each test is not that slow, but uh, there are a lot of benchmarks, and we need to make sure that we don't regress on all benchmarks. So in the Mobile devices are relatively slow, slower than the desktop, so that was really, uh, really killer um, for me. So solution, get a lot of devices and uh, automate the benchmark execution. The second, test, the test results are flaky. So test metrics are pretty flaky, and uh, they sometimes differ by plus minus 50% round to round. And uh, comparing the metrics from just one benchmark wrong, each uh, could lead to a uh, wrong con uh, to s uh, me to lead uh, draw a wrong conclusion. Solution: Repeat the benchmark runs. Uh, I recommend 20 times, uh, but you probably need at least 10 times. And side as a side effect, benchmarks are now 20 times slower. Uh, so we need to m get more and more devices. <laughs> the third test results are again flaky. <laughs> so for some tests, you can simply trust the average value. Uh, look at the its, its graph and uh, uh, red dots are the data points and the red bars are the average. And the left is the non oil bound and the right is oil bound. And uh, we get better? Uh, I think not, because the the distributions are by model, and the the kind of the the average depends on the luck of the uh, each benchmark round. Solution: Look at each result manually. Wow. So to recap and get many devices, repeat the benchmark a lot, and look at the data carefully. That's all. Thanks.
I thought we were only allowed to have one slide for some reason, so I only have one slide, and here it is. Um, I'm Emily. I'm from the Chrome security team. Um, how many of you have ever set up SSL before? How many of you have been confused while setting up SSL before? Yeah, okay, we, build a, we built a DevTools panel for you. Um, so we have a security panel in DevTools now. Um, we, uh, it's on Canary and Dev, so if you want to check it out and give us feedback, that would be awesome. Um, our goal is to explain the security status of a page, and if you're not getting a shiny green lock, we want it to make it easy for you to know why you're not getting a shiny green lock. Um, so it shows you things like your certificate details, um, if, you have like d if you're using deprecated crypto systems or cyber suites, um, it'll tell you that. It tells you about mixed content on the page. Um, you can see the certificate details for any, um, any sub-resource. So like if everything is good on the page, but you have some one bad sub-resource, uh, sub then we'll, we'll show you that. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot to the DevTools team who helped us um, get this get this built, and I hope you check it out on Canary and uh, tell us what you think. Thanks. So, Yoshin. So, I'm Yoshi. Is, uh, I'm a best friend of uh, Clusterfuzz. So clusterfuzz. So clusterfuzz every day sent five bugs to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm best friend. So in other words, I'm slave over clusterfuzz. So we Tokyo editing team is fixing the bugs from clusterfuzz and uh, editing bugs every day, and <laughs> we don't know when it's it end. So what this is an example of what cluster files create a script. So <coughs> this document open is a call during the insert and order list execution. Do you know why? Maybe nobody knows. So Actually, the JavaScript iframe unload event is executed by the append node. This is called append node here. Then if we keep the start node in the stack, is a parameter. So this document, start, start, start node parent node reference is broad because the document is somewhere. So I we love to the fix uh, this situation. So the, our current conclusion is uh, create a static code analy analy analyzer or analysis. So analyze our plan is uh, analyze to the correct function which execute the JavaScript and uh, doing a right variable analysis for the fun each functions. So if functions for the node position, ephemeral range, layout object, or and the other kind of uh, what the JavaScript will be cor corrupted. So we report uh, these uh, unsafe right variables to the developer, or you guys, or for me. So we hope uh, this kind of static code analyzer will be a bot, like a path, path bot. So compile the Blink C++ code into the LLVM bit code, or IR. They analyze the LLVM IR, like a word program optimization. So when once we detect the unsafe variables, we send uh, f uh, we file the CR bug like a uh, CR bug and uh, set a label with the static code analyzer or something. Then the assign to the code authors, not me, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so except we are dreaming that once we have a static code analysis framework or a bot. So we also want to the minimize, minimize the document lifecycle breaker. So in uh, editing code, we call a lot of update layout and update distribution call. In so we want to remove, remove uh, reduce the number of uh, these lifecycle breakers. Also, if possible, we want to the detect use after free statically. 
So once oil pan is released, no more use and use use after free, but uh, it uh, just turns into the just a memory leak or resource leak. So we should remove the such kind of uh, <coughs> such kind of things. Also, so there are a number of uh, script for the scope. So we want to the we maybe can detect uh, such uh, functions called the script in the script forbidden scopes. Yeah, that's all. So, Christian, I guess. So, there are four more crackers, so you can use it. Uh, hi, so I just wanted to give a quick update on what's going on with Flexbox uh, because I've been the one who's been fixing the bugs and updating the code to the spec. Um, so we are now uh, passing almost all of the tests in a test suite that the CSS working group has. Um, Levi is happy, although you have to, well, see below. Um, <laughs> there's, there's 10 failures, there's a couple uh, bugs and things we don't implement. Uh, one of them is actually a bug in the test that I haven't fixed yet. But it's a few things like visibility collapse and um, a few other minor things. Um, yeah, there's also, as I recently found out, the W3C test repository has another directory which has 148 tests that Mozilla has contributed. Um, since I wasn't aware of them until recently, I have no idea how many we pass or fail. Uh, but we should run we should run those as well. Uh, the other issue, the, well, the issue with this is that the spec is still sometimes changing. Um, a few weeks ago, the default value of flex spaces has changed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the table fix up, uh, co th um, table fix up is now different. It's actually no longer required, which works out for us because we haven't implemented that yet. Um, but the other issue is that the test suite is incomplete and is not getting up uh, updated when the spec is changing. So uh, the actual um, Outlook is not quite as good as you might think from 97% because there's a lot of tests that are missing. But uh, I'm, I want to upstream some of the tests. So what I've been working on was just lots of minor, or not minor, but miscellaneous bug fixes. Um, we are now a lot more interoperable with uh, with IE, with Edge, I should say, and Gecko. Uh, I've added some use counters for some of the spec changes to see if we can actually make those changes. So far, it's looking pretty good. Um, the stuff is not used on many websites. Uh, we do have better vertical writing and orthogonal flow support in Flexbox. Um, those some of those are kind of more edge cases, but some of those are surprising surprising bugs. There have been a lot of low quality tests. Not a, no, I don't know about twenty maybe low quality tests in the W three C test suite, which have been poorly written and weren't really expected to pass. So those are fixed now. Um, and one thing uh, was that I've recently uh, fully fixed. I think as min with auto, um, and for the last uh, week or two, I've been fixing the regressions from that in the Chrome UI mostly, and also the ChromeStatus.com website. Um, <laughs> current work, catching up with uh, with a, a few more spec changes. The intrinsic size algorithm has changed bo uh, both for widths and heights, uh, so I need to implement that. I've uh, now that the use counter results are back, I can actually do that. Uh, position absolute. Uh, elements are now have now a different static position, which I need to finish up implementing. Um, more bug fixes for interoperability, um, for upstream more tests, um, and a few more things that I want to work on. Percentage size children of flex atoms is somewhat important. People keep complaining that we don't get that right. Uh, flex basis content, uh, well, that's probably less important. Um, it's a relatively small feature, and then. Uh, aspect ratios, we don't handle those uh, quite right, um, and uh, various other things, and <laughs> various minor things that are missing. That's it. Hello. Hello, my name is Laszlo, I work for Samsung, and uh, I've been asked a few times what Samsung is doing here, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> um, so, 
In the last two and a half years, we basically had 66 intents. That's about 12% of all intents. Um, 43 additions and 23 removals. Um, in terms of bugs, we filed over 1,000. About 1,000 is still assigned to us, and uh, 670 is fixed by Samsung. Um, number of commits. Um, we just about a week ago reached exactly 5,000 commits. Yay. Um, <laughs> and uh, exactly two thirds is in blink, and one third is the rest. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, if you want a quick search on this, uh, you can go there and hit it, and it's pretty searchable. Um, a little bit about the exact motivation. Um, so we use Blink in various Samsung products. Um, we have our own Android browser. It's in the Play Store. And we also have other operating systems and uh, products based on Blink. Um, in addition, we deeply care about the web platform. And we also care about the Android Web View and even Android Chrome. Um, a little bit about the actual architecture for Samsung products. Um, so we use Blink, and we try to build it on top of content. Um, but we also like components a lot. Um, and we try not to reuse Chrome as much as we can do that. So if you find us moving code from Chrome to components, then you know why that is. Um, this is a few people that are here from Samsung. Um, we have three owners here, um, Rob, Vivek, and Balaj. Maybe you guys can quickly stand up so that people can say hi. <laughs> and uh, we have 30 committers altogether, and uh, five additional committers are also here. Um, maybe if you guys can stand up briefly. Um, like the other people who didn't stand up before. Yes. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. So. Hello everyone, I am Mustak from Google Waterloo. I'll give you a quick update on Point Revenue implementation status. So I also thought I'm allowed to have only one slide. So I had one slide with four lines, or five lines. I split them into two slides, two plus three lines, just to make it look bigger. OK. <laughs> okay. So what, what we have done so far? We have al we already have uh, basic uh, point event firing in place for touch and mou mouse events in all, all platforms, and for stylus events we only have support in Android so far. You can play this with uh, with, the, uh, with the this uh, runtime flag. I'll show you a quick demo. Oh, thanks. Okay, so here. So this demo is uh, based on Patrick Luke's uh, uh, pointer tracker demo, which he developed to show uh, pointer event support in uh, i10 on the, uh, Microsoft Surface 3. So I'm running the exact same demo on tip of the tree uh, uh, build. So you'll see the no, no, I just want to yes. So as as I move the stylus. It tracks the 3D orientation of the stylus as well as the pressure uh, shown as a circle on the screen. So I kind of ch cheated here a, li a little bit because, like, the <coughs> we are not seeing the movie uh, like movie events correctly. So I'm kind of hitting the screens so that uh, it appears as pointed down. But it, it is uh, it should be easy fix. So so pointer events are working. So we also have DevTools support for uh, monitor event, even listener breakpoints, uh, et cetera. So that's where we stand so far. And next, what are the major things 
that we need to do. First of all, we need to do a bit of refactoring in the event handling code in Blink. So currently, like we have the like event handling still driven by touch and mouse events, and we can we are kind of firing pointer event as a secondary event. But we really want to move to the, uh, like uh, the event handler that that is driven by pointer events and mouse and touch are the secondary uh, events from that. So that that needs some attention, and we need to focus on pointers. Uh, we need to implement pointer pointer capture support. Especially, we need to start that spec discussion about uh, implicit pointer cap pointer capture for touch events, and also Stylus needs some some low level work uh, for Mac and Windows. So here is my contact. If you need has, have some idea or bug, feel free to contact me. Thanks. Not working. Okay. Okay. So I'll just talk. Is the next one. Okay. So, and after that, you sign. Yeah. Sure. So, Kinuko san. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> loading effort. <laughs> so recently, I started working on various loading uh, stuff, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about those efforts. I'm well, still loading, but <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm Kinuko from Tokyo. So what's loading and blink? So definition-wise, it's pretty simple. So it's basically about getting resources from Chrome's networking layer, possibly with injection with cache, and passing them to blink modules to have them eventually painted. So simple enough. But the uh, implementation-wise, it's a bit of chaos. So I have a bunch of code loading code inside and uh, outside Blink. And uh, we have a bunch of re related modules like IPC, various parsers, various schedulers, web fonts, subsock, and et cetera, et cetera. So what we are working on? So currently, basically, we are working on three things. So we are working on beta metrics in order to measure user perceived loading experience. And uh, we are also working on optimizing end-to-end -end load performance. And uh, we also try to understand and uh, improve loading system, which means that the cleaner code, clearer system state, and uh, more documentation. So we have uh, various ongoing projects. So as I said, we are working on beta page load metrics. So actually, we have already, uh, there are many uh, existing page load time metrics, but most of them are, well, no, all of them are known to be broken, <laughs> so that uh, we are basically virtually re-implementing everything, so that uh, we are implementing new uh, metrics reporting system, and uh, we are also trying to add uh, useful time to fast or time to fast a uh, meaningful pain signal, and uh, we are also adding metrics for about rate, which should uh, roughly reflect user unhappiness in loading experience. We are also working on various loading optimizations. We are running several experiments for resource prioritization, uh, improved resource prioritization. And also, we are trying to uh, optimize web fonts loading because it takes time and uh, it blocks rendering. We are also running on, uh, working on several cache enhancements, like we are trying to ship stale while revalidate. You might have heard of that. And also, we are optimizing various related modules like HTML password thread. And the loading system health, recently we just started the investigation for tracking memory usage for resource. Because if you had the, uh, today's hurricanes talk about memory reduction, resource seems to be one of the biggest contributors for holding memory in Blink. So we are trying to investigate that. And uh, also we're kind of thinking about re-implementing memory cache because it seems to be uh, more complex than necessary. Anyway, so I have uh, also a bunch of plans for cleanups and, okay, sorry, <laughs> bug fixing. So I have them, but uh, I don't have time. But uh, probably you could imagine what, and the more should be coming. <laughs> but anyway, so <laughs> please join. <laughs> All right, take two. Take two. All right. Um, 
So I want to talk about an effort that's sort of been ongoing for like five years, um, which is uh, we've been making the rendering pipeline in Chrome more of a pipeline and less of a just sort of you run things on timers, um, which is to say when you run a frame, we now run through this cycle every single time. You update the animation time, you fire per frame events like window resize events, you fire request animation frame, you update style, do animations, update layout, and you paint. We do this every frame. Um, some of these things we only do once per frame, and that's the like innovation here, is you don't like randomly call request animation frame in weird places. Um, and this makes for a platform that developers can reason about, which is to say request animation frame always happens before paint. Uh, this is not true in browsers globally. Uh, the other thing is this explicitly lists where you're allowed to run script. Script can't run between the different phases in the pipeline. Um, again, platform developers can reason about. So what we're doing now, what this doc is about, is turning this into a spec. The HTML spec specs something, but it's not this. And browsers are totally inconsistent on what they do. Um, in August, we presented this to some other browser vendors, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. There was like one little thing we don't quite agree on but we can work that out later. Um, if anyone's interested in helping make this happen, we don't fully hit this pipeline today. There are places, for example, under layout where you can run script. Um, so we have stuff to fix in our code, and we have spec work to do to like fix the spec and file bugs against other browser vendors where they don't meet the spec. Did I leave anything out? Yeah. Uh, We'll, we'll write tests for this. Uh, just to call out Sammy, who's, I don't know where Sammy is. Sammy's over here. Sammy landed the most amazing patch that turns off the pipeline for iframes that are off screen. So other browsers stop running request animation frame. You'll notice it's one block. And in Chrome, with some flag turned on, uh, we don't run any of it for off screen iframes, which is amazing because that means that all those ads that are way down off the screen don't even bother like computing style or painting. And it also makes like a really rational platform. You know that if request animation frame runs, that you are painting. And so our goal here is that the browser makes sense, which means that when developers develop on it, it also makes sense. Go ahead, switch to the next one. If Someone come help us make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so next call. Hey, everyone. Um, Nasco, another Chrome security person. And I just wanted to give you a quick update on the status of AutoProce iframes. I know Daniel has been talking about AutoProce iframes since Blink on 1. So you would think by now it would be done, but not quite. So I'll give you my perspective, which is security. Security people tend to ask for things that other users don't. So we're a little bit weird. But where we come from is we want our site isolation to work. But it under, the under the hood, what it does is it's basically a combination of AutoProce iframes, which we want everybody to be excited about, but also there's a process model and security policy. And for, for us, this is basically what site isolation is about. But a lot of people also should care about auto process frames. And the question is, well, why? We heard in the morning people were talking about a platform that actually makes sense, where we can um, quickly update it, that is reasonable, that is flexible, and everything. So people are concerned about third parties. People are throwing out ideas about UI threads or multi-threaded rendering on the web platform. So what does that mean? Well, to me, that means it's a good architecture. So in general, if we take the notion of, let's think of AutoProce iframes as just separating things out such that they have clean interfaces and things that are not in the same origin, can run independently, what a novel idea. Um, it basically gives us a good architecture to experiment with. We can throw them in a different thread if you want, in a different process, or just anything we want to try out. So we're starting to experiment soon. Um, we're going to try to do uh, limited cases in Q Q4 and Q1. The idea is extensions in Chrome have privileges today, and they can also host um, web content. Also, web pages can pull in extension iframes. 
So well, for these limited cases, we want to actually enable all the process iframes. And we're starting trials within two to three weeks. And we want to ship something at the end of the quarter or the beginning of Q1. So once we're done with that, though, there's a long pull to actually ship it for the entire web. So we need help. And whoever is interested, just talk to me or Daniel. Thanks. So the final one is KBR. Uh, mirroring? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, full screen. All right, real quick. Uh, hi. Uh, my name's Ken. Uh, there's an upgrade coming to the WebGL API, which lets you do 3D uh, graphics on the web, uh, fully accelerated with the graphics chip that's already in your phone and already in your laptop, and already in your watch, by the way. Um, so there is a, uh, we were invited to give a course at SIGGRAPH Asia. The Slides are up on the web. You can find these by searching for WebGL presentations. It's second hit on Google. So here is just a pretty picture to show you something neat. So um, this is a particle system, a million particles running on the GPU, started from JavaScript. Uh, we load a font in 3.js, extrude it into 3D, choose a million points on that font, and upload those points to the graphics processor where it runs the particle simulation statefully entirely on the graphics card. And with the upgrade to the WebGL API that's under development now, th and this will already run on like all of your smartphones, um, you can do really nifty effects. So here's a you know fizzy particle effect that's done by choosing random numbers on the graphics card, which is really a thing that you couldn't do or cannot do effe efficiently with the current API. And it's a nifty enough effect. I mean, you, know, you can see cool color for particles, but it, it really, um, the, the stateful nature of it is really expressed when you hook in your leap motion controller, and then you can just uh, you know sweep them away <laughs> with your hand from a web page. So no no joke, and this really works. In it's on GitHub, but you have to turn on a flag in Chrome right now to make it work. Uh, and we are trying to ship it outside of the flag. So that's pretty much it. Code's out there. Um, play around. So thank you very much. So that's it. So actually, I didn't think we can schedule 19 talks in 60 minutes. So thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>